Thank you very much. It's good to see you all. Um, the first thing I'll say, it's not on my notes, is um, I just really am very confident that God's going to speak to a lot of you guys this morning. Um, and actually, most of what's been said this morning is almost like what I've written down. And I haven't spoken to any of you guys during the week about what I'm talking about. And you haven't spoken to me about what you're going to pray about this morning. So just have confidence that God um, is actually here and is actually going to do stuff. And yeah, let's go with that. So for those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Phil. Um, and this morning, like Nathan said, we're going to talk about persistent prayer. But to start with, I'm going to tell you a story. It's not a very fun story, but it gets us into it. So um, uh, last spring, Jamie Furbrush, who's not here, I don't think, but some of you guys know him from the church, he, asked, he was basically recruiting people for a touch rugby team. And um, I've been looking to find a sport to get into, so I was like, okay, I'll do that. And in my head, I had, um, I've always been fairly good at sport, and I had played rugby at school, and I was like, actually, I think I'll probably be quite good at touch rugby. I genuinely thought, yeah, this could be really good, because I played rugby and I really enjoyed it, but then when I went to uni, um, everyone was at least a foot taller than me and about two foot wider than me, um, and I didn't really fancy the physical contact, so I just played football. But, so I went into um, to, to training, and they trained at Summary Park. I turned up for my first time feeling fairly like, actually, they might be surprised how good I am, and, and maybe I'm gonna, maybe I'm gonna take this league by storm. Um, and then within about five minutes, I was like, ooh, it's very different. So it's still rugby, but a lot of the skills and, and instincts you have from playing normal rugby or contact rugby are actually counterproductive for touch rugby. So in contact rugby, you're supposed to run into people and try and run through them, keep your momentum going. But actually, that completely slows the game down in, in touch rugby. So I realized very quickly that actually I wasn't that good. And everyone else there was quite good and quite experienced and had played for a good few years. So I thought, OK, what do I do now? I turned up. I was a bit rubbish, everyone else was quite good. My natural instincts weren't really working for me. But I, didn't, I wasn't going to know that until I actually started to give it a go. And I don't really enjoy, which probably is the same for most people, I don't really enjoy doing stuff that I'm not very good at. So like, if there's a sport to give it a try, I'll give it a try, but if it doesn't quite click, I'll go, right, let's move on. Because normally I'm quite good at things, so I'll, I'd like to do that. And I'll do those things, because it feels a bit better. But I suppose I'm old enough now that I knew if I wanted to play touch rugby, I'd have to just stick at it. So, um, could I have the first slide, please? Um, so that leads me into what we're talking about this morning, persistence, needing to be persistent about stuff. So what is persistence? Persistence, as a definition, is continuing firmly or obstinately, which is not a word I say very often, but it's a good word, I think, actually, for this, in an opinion or course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. So I really needed to show perseverance and persistence uh, with touch rugby because I was meeting difficulty and opposition in my lack of skills and the quality of the other players. So what I'd like to do um, is for all of you guys to try and engage with what we're talking about this morning, um, I'd like you to think about what persistence looks like for you. Um, I remember hearing this thing not long ago about like, words don't have meanings in themselves. They, we give them meaning in the way that we use them. And so I'd like you to think about what does that mean to you? What does persistence mean to you? So the question is, can you think of a time when you have needed to be persistent, or if you don't think of anything like that, what comes to mind when I say we're talking about persistence? It can be something deep, it can be something trivial, like my touch rugby story is fairly trivial, or it could be something that's not even from your own life and an example you've seen. Now, the challenge I'm gonna to give to you is that I actually want you to talk about this with the people around you. So I know that for me, if I was sat where you are, I'd be a bit annoyed now because I don't really like doing that. So I'm sorry for those people who don't love chatting to the people around you about these kind of things. But we're going to have just a few minutes where I want you to talk to the person next to you because I feel like it just builds a, a picture of what persistence is, what it looks like in our lives, the kind of experiences we've got with it. So two or three people around you, just someone be brave, start talking to them and say, a time in my life where I've had to be persistent is this. I'm going to give you five minutes, and it'll be very awkward if no one talks. I'm not going to talk. Well,
Okay, 30 more seconds just to wrap up your chat. That's all right. Okay, <clears throat> so I've just had a couple of helpers going around. So what I want you to just do quickly for later is just check that you've got an envelope and a piece of paper near you. And if they're not near you, they'll be near the end of the row. So if you could just quickly pass those out amongst yourselves. There's one piece of paper and one envelope per person. There we go. Thanks, Quinn. So just while I'm talking, because I don't mind if you're doing that while I'm talking for this bit. Um, as long as you pay attention later, that's fine. So just make sure you've got those. Keep those to one side. We're going to need those later, hopefully. You're going to join in with what I want you to do later. Um, I th I've been doing kids' work a long time now, so I think I'm going to get you to do a kids' activity. Um, OK, so bring it back in. Thank you for doing that. I know that, that like I said, it could be a bit tricky to have to try and talk about something. So hopefully that's helped to just connect you with this topic, to sort of think, right, what is persistence for you? What do you think persistence is? Um, so just go to that definition again. Persistence, continuing firmly or obstinately in an opinion or course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. And our topic for January is prayer. Um, so we're obviously going to look at persistent prayer or persistence in prayer specifically. Now, for me, that's two things. So if we could just go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, persistence for me in prayer is asking or doing. Now, obviously, it's probably there's lots more as well. But for this morning, anyway, we're going to look at those two things. So asking, continuing in the course of action, course of action to keep on asking God for something, even when met with difficulty or opposition, like it not seeming like it's answered or seeming like there's something in the way. <clears throat> and doing, keeping on doing something, even when it gets difficult, gets past the enjoyable phase, gets past the easy phase, um, and you need some discipline to keep going through it. So we're going to look at one at a time. So next slide, please, is um, persistence in asking. So we only need persistence if there's difficulty or opposition in the way. It's not persistence if it happens first time. So if I was naturally really good at touch rugby when I turned up like I thought I might be, then I wouldn't have needed to show any persistence, really. I'd just actually just turn up and, and just be great. <clears throat> but when you're met with a bit of difficulty and a bit of opposition, then you need to show some persistence to keep going. So I suppose there's two choices. You either carry on doing it and show persistence, or you stop doing it, and then you don't have the difficulty anymore because you're not doing it. So... That's obviously a trivial, trivial thing, but I think it, it demonstrates how it can be for us. So we can sometimes need it when we're praying because maybe sometimes or quite often we feel like we're praying for something and we don't see the answer. We don't see that it's been met. We don't see that we're getting a result. <clears throat> so like uh, I, was in, I was in kids' work last week, but I listened to Nathan's preach afterwards on YouTube. And... Um, <clears throat> like Nathan did, I want to acknowledge that there are times when we do pray and it doesn't happen. And I can't give you an answer as to why it's not happening. So that's what, I'm not going to do that this morning. I'm not going to try and tell you this is why your prayer hasn't been answered so far. Um, I don't know what situations you're in. I'm not going to profess to understand you. But what I do think is that God has given me a couple of ideas to talk about this morning and we can work through it together and then there's a way to apply it later. So hopefully God will tell you something. I won't. I won't give you an answer, but hopefully you can get one from God. So, <clears throat> next slide, please. This idea of persistence in asking, but then not seeing. So we're going to read a, a verse from the Bible. So there's a story that Jesus tells. It's not going to be on the screen. So I'm going to read it to you, or you can look it up. So it's Luke 18, 
verse 1 to 8. I'll give you a second to get there. Because actually there's not that many stories that I found that really, really worked. And even this one, I didn't get it to start with. So we're going <clears> to <throat> talk through it together and you'll see my, my thought process of, of where we go to it. So it's Luke 18, verse 1 to 8. Okay, everybody ready? Cool. So, and he, that's Jesus, told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. I'll just pause there for a second. It's really helpful that Luke has put that in because often we have to try and figure out what the parable is about. But they've told us here, this parable is to try and encourage people always to pray and not to lose heart. So hopefully that'll help us when we're trying to understand it. So he said, Jesus said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he, the judge, refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Michael, you like that bit. That beat me down bit is actual boxing terminology. It was actual fighting terminology. He was, Jesus was saying the judge was feeling like he was being verbally beaten up by this widow, and he's like, oh, I'll give in. <clears throat> basically KO'd. So to summarize, as a bad judge, he doesn't fear God and he doesn't respect people. There's a persistent widow, but she only needs to be persistent, like we said, she only needs to be persistent because she encountered difficulty. If he'd given her justice the first time, then she could be called a brave widow or a courageous widow, but not a persistent widow. If the judge had said yes first time, she's not being persistent, but she needs to show it because he's saying no. And then Jesus says that the judge basically gives in. He wants an easier life. He's, he's given um, as much attention as he wants to, and he wants to get on with the rest of his job. Not because he cares about her or fears God or wants to do the right thing. So even someone like that will respond to persistence. Verse 6 to 8, then these are the last bit of this little bit. <clears throat> so the parable's finished. And now Jesus says, the Lord said, this is Jesus. Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith on earth. Now I read that and I was like, oh, I don't really understand what Jesus is trying to tell us there. Is Jesus saying that God is like the judge? I'm assuming no, because he starts by saying the judge doesn't fear God or or um, respect man. So it's like, okay, well, God's not going to be like that. But oh, is God not like that, but then we're supposed to be like the persistent widow? So maybe, I think, maybe. But I still didn't quite get it. But then it does say the parable is to teach us to always pray and not to lose heart. So I'm hoping that that's what it's doing. But I still couldn't quite get it. I found looking back into the previous chapter just really helped. So the context that this parable is in is that Jesus has just been pretty, pretty deep and heavy with the disciples. So the Pharisees in, in the previous chapter, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 20, they're asking Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And then Jesus goes into this very deep explanation of what it's going to be like when the kingdom comes. And it's pretty heavy and pretty maybe scary. We won't look at it in detail now. So... For me, it seems like this next parable comes from Jesus thinking, oh, okay, maybe I need to try and give these guys some encouragement, try and help them along the way, because I've been pretty, pretty serious about something, and maybe they're going to be a bit worried. Um, but the key bit for me is in, in chapter 17, verse 22. You can look at it if you like. Um, Jesus says, uh, he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And for me, that kind of sets up the parable that he tells next. He's acknowledging to the disciples and warning them, giving them some advice, saying, you will desire some stuff, but you won't see it. You're not going to get everything that you're desiring. <clears throat> so what encouragement does Jesus give his disciples? That story that he tells us is telling us to not lose heart and to always pray. And Luke points that out to us to make sure we don't miss it. So we've got to really focus in on that, I think. 
I don't have an answer for how you do that necessarily, but I feel like we can sort of work through it together, hopefully, and get a bit of a, an idea. So Jesus offers the parable to his disciples after being pretty heavy with them, pretty serious, and going, you're going to desire some stuff, but you're not going to get to see it. <clears throat> he then says, um, at the end of the parable, he asks um, two questions, but they're rhetorical questions, and then he gives one answer. So the two questions he asks is verse 6, uh, sorry, verse 7. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? So that's two questions. Will, God, will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? He doesn't wait for an answer. He then gives an answer. I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. And he being God. So Jesus' answer there is, you guys are, might be feeling a bit discouraged, a bit down, don't know how to go forward. This is my answer. <clears throat> And that's great, those answers are really good. Um, but I don't necessarily think it leads us straight into how that applies to our lives. And I think we need to do a bit of work there. But let's be clear what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say to his disciples, oh, you're going to get everything you want. Everything you desire, you're going to get an answer for. <clears throat> he doesn't say, um, keep asking and you will get what you want. And I think sometimes we can maybe look at these persistent stories in the Bible and, and think that's what the message is, that we're supposed to keep asking and eventually God will give us what we want, like the judge gave in to the widow. <clears throat> but I think we all know from life experience that doesn't always work like that, so it, it, can't, it can't be that for me. Um, the parable was brought on the back of and set up by Jesus saying, you will desire stuff and not see it. So the context of that just doesn't lead to Jesus then meaning by this that we will get what we want when we ask enough. It's a bit like when you've got kids, they think if they keep on asking you enough that you might just say yes. <clears throat> it doesn't always work because sometimes we do know better, don't we? But not all the time as parents. So if the comfort from Jesus is not about getting that end result, um, getting to see it, having an answer, maybe his solution is more about the process that we go through. So Jesus doesn't promise anything other than he promises one thing. I tell you, God will give justice to his elect. So that's the only thing he promises is justice. And it's interesting, I think it's mentioned a few times this morning. For me, that, that justice idea is about God being on our side. God being, it's, it's a word that means vindication um, to sort of, in some contexts, could be could get revenge. Like to, to, um, that's what the widow wanted. Someone had wronged her and she wanted justice to be brought. So... What we can be certain of is that Jesus is promising that God will be on our side. God will bring justice for us. But while we wait for that, what are we supposed to do? Keep praying and not lose heart. That's all, that's all he says. That's all we have. And like I say, the alternative is to maybe think that Jesus means keep praying for the same thing over and over and over again in the same way. That might be true with what persistence is, but I don't think that's sustainable from my personal experience and from the stories I hear from other people, I don't think that's a sustainable way to be in relationship with someone. And that's what God is, is all about, isn't it? Is having a relationship with us. And I think being in that cycle of re repetition and persistence like that can be very painful, disappointing, discouraging, one-dimensional, and probably quite limiting on our lives. And so that's what I, I don't think that's what Jesus means by always praying. My conviction from this, so let's hope that this is what God is saying, is that Jesus wants our always praying to be focused on building our relationship with God, not on the things that we're asking for. Giving him our attention, allowing him to speak to us, allowing him to influence us, um, allowing space for God's spirit to come alongside us. So maybe the, the point of the bad judge there is that God is not like the bad judge. That the bad judge is an example of what God is not like. That God will not just react to us just badgering him. Actually, God is good and on our side. Even if we don't understand what's going on, if we have to believe anything to get us through life, it's going to be that God is on our side. <clears throat> so, that's me having my thought process of that passage, trying to understand what that was about. Um, and I think what would be really good is to try and figure out what, does that, what do we do with that? How can we apply that in some way. So I think to how that might apply to my life, um, and I, that's all I can speak of really. Um, so I can think of an example of Rosie and I uh, praying for something, a desire for us for like five years now, that it just, it feels like it should be okay to pray for. It feels like it's a good thing. 
And for as much as we could know, it feels like it's in God's plan for us. But we've been asking, we haven't seen it. And yes, this results in confusion, disappointment, anger, frustration, heartache. But I can also honestly say that when I felt weary, which is what that losing heart phrase is about, is being weary and frail, the only thing that has really helped is when I've come back to God with that desire and said, this is still what I want. I still think it should be right. It's not happening. It's really annoying. It sucks. I don't understand. Somehow, that helps me not to lose heart. Helps me to keep on asking for it, if it still feels right. Gives you that hope and helps you not to give up. But as well as helping me to persist in asking, which is a big deal, because otherwise you could just decide not to keep asking because it's too difficult. It also, that process of going back to him brings me closer to God. It builds my relationship with him. And it helps me to have perspective on what I'm actually desiring and what I want and what I, um, my priorities are. And that's the thing. I think God's priority, like I said, is always to have a relationship with us, to bring us close, to be with us. Whereas so often our priorities are about what he has or hasn't done for us or what he is or isn't doing for us. And that's quite challenging, isn't it? And my point on that is I don't think we can expect to build a relationship with God unless we're willing to be vulnerable with him and be real with him and be honest with him. And when things are annoying and it's making us angry and we're angry at him, to actually say that to him. Because otherwise, we, we keep it to one side. And we don't like God in that part of our lives and we hide that bit away. And in human relationships, that doesn't work. So why would it work with God? Unless we're going to allow ourselves to fall apart a bit, to be vulnerable, to be honest, then we can't grow in our relationship with God. And unfortunately, those times of vulnerability often come from a time of crisis or a time of trial or a difficulty. When things are going really swimmingly, you don't need to be as vulnerable because everything's okay. And the emotions that you have are ones that you're happy to share with people. Whereas when things are tough, the emotions and the feelings and the thoughts you have are ones that you're uncertain about. So we need to keep coming to God, keep involving him in our lives and keep being honest with him. And we need to hold on to our faith in the hope that he is good, that God is on our side. And this is another thing that someone else talked about this morning. So in, in Psalm 147, 11, you don't need to look there necessarily, but it's just one of, a, of many places in the Bible where it says, we need to have hope in God's steadfast love. And that steadfast love, um, I think it was Paul who brought something this morning about kindness. I can't even see where Paul is. Kindness. Steadfast love at its heart is about faithful kindness. That's what it means. If we're going to be believing and holding on to anything and having a hope in anything, the Bible tells us it should be God's faithful, steadfast love, that he is kind to us and for us and in it for the long haul. On the opposite side, if we're not listening to Jesus here and doing this, what other messages are we going to hear and what are we going to listen to? And perhaps, if you're looking at the flip side, what would the devil be trying to say to us? Just give up? Your desire is not important enough for God to care about it? Keep this part of your life away from God, because it's safest, you're in control of it, you won't get hurt. Don't dream or hope or want stuff, because you'll just be disappointed. So whose voice are we going to choose to listen to? Jesus' voice or the other things around us? So, I'm going to ask you to do something. Some of you might not like this, but I'd like you to just breathe. I want to take 10 deep breaths. Deep breath in and deep breath out. Do that 10 times. We're going to transition to the next point, but I feel like that will just help keep you awake, get oxygen to your brain, but also help you think about what we've just been talking about. Don't breathe so deeply that you cause yourself to have an asthma attack or anything. For, like, for medical reasons, you need to just do shallow rest. That's fine. Just take a second. Okay, so I said there were two things to look at. This first one that we've gone through was, for me, the key. And this second one, if we go on to the next slide, please, thank you, um, is about doing. So I said persistence is about asking and about doing. So this is about doing and not giving up. So this one we're going to be pretty quick on and get on to an application thing. So I don't feel like I need to 
preach to you about stuff that you should be doing or feel like you should be doing, but you've given up on. Because we all live with that every day, don't we, as Christians? We live in this perpetual thing of, I've not read my Bible enough, I've not prayed enough, I've not spent enough time with God. So I'm not here to um, convict you of things that you feel like you should be doing. Um, But what I would say is that persistence applies in this area as well. It's not just about asking all the time. It's actually, maybe for some of us this morning, that asking thing isn't a big deal. We're not going through that at the moment. Maybe this is where God's speaking to us. Um, And actually, I was... When Michael preached at the start of January, he talked about, um, it's that section of James 1, 22, 25, being a doer, not just a hearer of the word. So hearing what God says and then going and doing it, God says that we'll be blessed in our doing if we do that. So I feel like that's saying that God will actually support us. He'll give us help. He'll make things easier the more that we do it. And most of us would know that if we're trying to build a habit, the more you do it, the more you do it, the easier it gets. But actually, when it's something that's going to bring us in relationship to God, I feel like God actually supernaturally helps us as well, and he might bring things into line to make it easier. So this is what I'm talking about now. is just quite simply where we know there are actions we feel like God has said, let's try doing this, or you've thought, this will be a really good idea, this will build my relationship with God. But then we find difficulty, we encounter opposition, like that definition of persistence, opposition and difficulty. And when we encounter that, we've got two options. We persist take on the challenge and keep going, or we stop it, because if we stop, then the difficulty and opposition goes away. So let's be doers and not just hearers, but let's be realistic. It's not easy to be a doer. If it was, then we wouldn't need these verses to encourage us, would we? So we'll hear something, think it's a great idea, and then not see it through. But that's where we can do stuff. We can ask God to help us. We can also do stuff ourselves to help us. So... um, What I'd like to do, like I said, I don't have answers for you guys, but I do believe that God has answers and wants to speak to everybody this morning. So what I'd like to do is I'd like you all to try and engage with this um, in your real life. So this is where you need your paper and envelopes. You've got two options. So the next slide, please. Two options of how you're going to respond to this is um, prayer or doing a letter. Okay, I want you to do at least one. I'm challenging you on that. Don't just sit there and, and not do anything. So the prayer, the prayer idea is to uh, head on over to the side and, and the prayer ministry team will be there and you can pray with them or grab someone who you're sat near with and pray with them. The letter idea is to write a letter to yourself. Now, you will need to put your address on the front because otherwise I won't get it to you. But if you genuinely put your address on the front and write a letter to yourself, hand it into these black boxes at the front, I will then post it to you, but not straight away. I'll do it in like four or five weeks' time. So the idea being that God, I believe, is speaking to people here this morning, but what the devil will do is try and quieten that over the next few weeks, try and sort of make it a bit misty, not clear, sort of discourage you from that. And so if you write something down that God's been speaking to you this morning, it will come back to you in a few weeks' time to remind you of what God was saying, remind you of how to persist, how to keep going. Now, if you don't have a pen, there are loads of pens at the front and things, and Michael might wander around and pass them out and Rosie. But there's pencil crayons as well if you want to do a drawing to yourself, you want to be creative, you want to colour. This is my kids' work coming out. You might want to draw what God has been saying to you this morning. You want to colour something. What has God brought to your attention this morning? What is God saying to you? Which of those words from when we were in the worship time stood out to you, you want to remind yourself of? Or... Is there something that you know you want to do? You want to start doing X, Y, Z, getting up early to read the Bible, getting up late to read the Bible, reading your Bible, praying, whatever you want to do during the week that you have decided is a good idea, but you know you're going to struggle to keep going with it. Write that down. Write a thing to yourself to encourage yourself to do it so that in a few weeks' time it will come back to you and you can, yeah, get some encouragement to keep being persistent. 